Hey everybody, Mario Dennis here, your host with the Keeping It Real Estate Podcast, and today my guest is my good friend and actually my neighbor, Emmett yeah. Combs from Combs Premier Realty Group. How are you doing, Emmett? Awesome, awesome. Thank you for having me. Yeah, a lot of times I have people on the podcast that I never met before, you know, like we do a quick online chat and they come over. Mm -hmm. um, but with you, it's different because we literally live a block away from each other. So that's Literally. pretty cool. Yeah. And sometimes morning running buddies. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. We caught up with each other the other the other morning, which was a it was a good time. Mm -hmm. It's funny because running is kind of a lonely activity. It is. It is. And I use my morning running just to help me woo, like woosa. You know, yeah. it sort of um, clears my mind from any stress or distractions I may have had from the day before helps me just start my day brand new. Yeah, it's the same for me. So obviously there's the physical benefits that you get from running, mm -hmm. but the mental aspect is huge for me. Huge, huge. You know, because that's, I tell people all the time, like if I could, if I could take that thing that I feel like the way that I feel after a long run and put it on a pill form and just take that, I wouldn't <laughs> run. But but we don't have that, right? So I got to go and, and get a run in to get to that mindset, to that state. Yes. Um, so like what does your morning routine look like before the running? Um, so generally, my morning routine is um, my wife works from home quite often. Um, okay. So she doesn't have to commute anywhere, thank God. Um, and so we'll wake up and, you know, feed the dog, make the coffee, eat some breakfast with my daughter, playing around, you know. Um, and then we just kind of hang around as a family, just playing and BSing or whatever, you know, for for about an hour or so. And then um, around 8.15 or so, I'd like to get going with okay. whatever I'm going to do, like as I run, if I'm going to run or I'm going to ride my bike or I'm going to do weights, whatever it is that, that I'm going to do that day. I start doing that around that time and then, depending on how long the workout is, mm -hmm. then after that, I'm, I'm shower and I'm ready to go, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, sometimes you have an appointment before that. And so yep. then you change the schedule accordingly, you know, but on a perfect day, that's kind of how it goes. Okay. Okay. Mine is similar. Mine is similar. Uh, my day starts at like four in the morning. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I have a, a little morning routine. I don't like to talk to people in the morning, right? So mm -hmm. that's why I wake up at four in the morning. So I have enough time to make my coffee. I like to um, meditate. I read my Bible. I say my prayers. I have um, a book that I read in the morning. And then I reflect on what my daily journal was from the day before. Mm -hmm. And I reflect on that for about 15, 20 minutes. I always put my time on. Then I meditate again, and then I go work out. So mm -hmm. it like it, it allows me to really absorb um, all the missed opportunities from the day before, and I sort of replay, you know, what conversations stood out to me, what relationships that I met, um, and then I just look at how I could have responded better, look at how I could have maybe engaged better, I could have handled the situation better, because you know, in my in my position, I have I deal with a lot of different personalities on a day-to-day -day basis. Right, because for people that don't know, you are a broker owner. Yes. And you have multiple offices. Yes. In yes. multiple cities. Yes. Yes. And um, that part is a bit challenging. Um, I would say you would have to be a people's person to deal with uh, the different personalities on a day-to-day. -day. And I don't really just – I'm very engaged and active, so I try to talk to at least – five to ten agents every single day and just to see where they're going just to see you know how the day's been on um, what they've been missing and what they're trying to accomplish are they staying on track you know so I, I have a little routine that I want to that I like to do with them as well but that morning routine is very important for me to be able to woo side clear my mind look at you know like I say the missed opportunities from the day before and things that I want to do better or things that I want to continue to do more of so that just allows me to reflect back, get my day going. So uh, I try to be out of the house by like 8.30. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, depending on my, my schedule, it may run back a little bit to 9 because I end up taking a call before i supposed to. Mm -hmm. So I try not to take a call before like 8.30. Yeah. If I take a call before 8.30, my day is thrown off. 
because I mess up their whole routine. But sometimes, you know, you, you see that phone call, it's like, mm-hmm. uh, and you know how we are, even though, you know, I'm in a position where I'm in, I, it, I need all pending deals. So if, if it's a call that could possibly be a pending deal, sure. I'm picking it up. Well, you, you have to. I think that's part of the mindset in real estate that sometimes lacks from agents that are successful or brokers when they get to a certain uh, success level. It's they think that it's okay to defer those calls. Mm. And so my rule of thumb has always been, if I would have taken that call the first day that I got my real estate license, I'm taking it today. Nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. And so, um, you know, so that whole idea like, oh, well, I don't work with certain buyers now. I don't work with Mm. certain price points now. I'm like, no, nope, nope, (laughs) nope. We don't do that. We don't do that because if I got my real estate license yesterday, I remember Mm -hmm. what it felt like the next day, and I would have helped anyone Mm -hmm. on God's green earth find a house. Absolutely. And so I am still, you know, the only time I will not work with someone is if there's a personality compatibility issue. And Mm -hmm. it's only happened maybe less than a handful of times in my entire career. Mm -hmm. And I try to catch it ahead of time before it becomes an issue so that I can refer them to someone. So I can be like, hey, listen, I don't think this is going to work out long term, but I have someone that I think would mesh really well with your personality. And people have appreciated that so that far. That is a great way to look at it. Um, I had challenges with that before. Uh, now that I have a, a elaborate team, mm-hmm. I have pillars in place. So when I run across somebody, like my conversation with customers and clients are very brief anyways. Mm-hmm the introduction, and then, of course, I pass them off to somebody to do the, hand, the day-to-day hands-on. But when I run into that that aspect of it, I have, you know, my wife, she's come on board, and she's like the lifesaver, right? Because mm-hmm. she brings that soft touch, you know, and she just knows how to handle those conversations, and she, I, w- I, w- I guess, like manage those conversations, those relationships a lot better than I would be and mm-hmm. because I'll be short and – you know, just go about my day and forget about them. But my wife, she's, you know, she'll be like, oh, no. And do all the things that, you know, women do for us, softening up the relationship and yeah. nourishing it. So she, she's Yeah, and perfect. oftentimes it's just a different perspective. It's having that different perspective because that's a challenge, too. I think a lot of real estate agents struggle with that, specifically if they don't have the support, which is mm-hmm. why I admire what you're talking about, about talking with your agents talking to a handful of them every day. So mm-hmm. maybe a, over the course of a week, you've talked to every one of the agents in your company. Yep. Because oftentimes what a real estate agent just needs is a fresh perspective. Mm-hmm. And so it's funny because I've had so many, I have agents call me consistently just to kind of run a situation by me because I've always made it kind of like an open door policy. I'm happy to help any agent that wants to better themselves mm-hmm. or that just wants a different perspective on something. And they'll be like, hey, I got this situation going on. What do you think? Like, you know, this other agent, what a jerk. And I'm like, hey, <laughs> hey, 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 hey. I'm like, yes, jerk. No, we're not taking this personal. So let's step back, yes. you know, like, and, and oftentimes, because we run a solo business that you wear so many hats on, people don't know how to do that, um, having a separate perspective and having your wife, it's just, a, it's huge in that regard because you have that, that automatic second perspective. Yes. And you don't yes. have to bring her up to speed on it. She's in it. She's in it on every one of them. So um, that has been the blessing. But of course, you know, in order to get there, you had to go through the curse, meaning, you know, learning to work yeah, with your wife every day. Jeez. Yeah. But I, that know. can be a challenge, I'm sure. <laughs> yes. But um, being that we have multiple offices, it allows us space apart, you know, because maybe every, every two weeks I'm down in Miami. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I have a week or so um, away from her and, and that, that's good because it allows her the opportunity to regroup. Know, yep, regroup, take the front seat, and you know, sort of, you know, check her boundaries when it comes to the things that she should know, mm-hmm. and then she'll know if she doesn't know as much if she have to reach out to me for a clarification. Yeah. So it, it's good because when I'm there, I, I'm so used to doing everything by myself because before last year it was just me, mm-hmm. and so I've learned to let go a little bit and. I've been, I want to say probably last year because I, I just don't like to let things slip through the crack. So I'm sure. always over everything, right? And I've been learning to let go a little bit. So now when I leave, of course, it allows her to, you know, you know, test those boundaries if she's really up to up to par.
hard on up to speed because if I was there, I would catch it before, you know, she would have an opportunity. Yeah, and that's, <laughs> that's, it's the hard, one of the hardest things with growing in real estate is that, um, that removing yourself from certain things so that you can give space for someone to help you. It's like, mm-hmm. it's a typical thing. Like, we don't want to let other people help us. I it's going to be better if we do it. And we know that it's consciously, tough. but uh. we don't do it. We, it's tough to do. You know, I think physically, it's probably um, relaxing, right? It, it helps us physically, but I think mentally, you ta- it takes a mental toll on you because you're thinking, you know, okay, are they going to do this right? Are they going to forget this? You know, and you sort of all, all already like trying to, you know, put your mind frame in a place where just in case they slip up. It's like your mind is going overwork. Mm-hmm. Okay, what I need to have in place just in case, mm-hmm. you know, and, and and sometimes all you have to do is just relax, relax, you know, you, you create the extra anxiety. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 a it's a delicate balance to grow a real estate business. It's even more delicate if you do it with your spouse, I imagine. Oof. Yes. <laughs> um, so you have the office in South Florida mm-hmm. Plantation. And, and the one in Metro West in Central Florida. Well, actually, we're in Winter Garden. We moved. We you moved? Yep. Okay. We're, this is our second year in Winter Garden, so we're right off West Colonial. Oh, very cool. Very mm-hmm. cool. And how many agents you have now? We are at 40. Wow. Yes, we have uh, 40 that's agents. That's a lot of growth, huh? Uh, it is. You know, um, with, with our team, because it's, it's so – it's an intimate team, let me say that. Mm-hmm. Um, and we treat everyone like family. So when I, I, I mean, honestly, I think I probably meet with maybe about six or seven agents every single week. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's, I, I have to say, when you have a, a, a family setting, mm-hmm. you have to protect the family values. You know what I mean? So it, it's everybody that sit across the table, you, you just can't let them, you know, inside your home. Mm-hmm. You know, so it, the views have to be the same. People have to respect, you know, the boundaries that are already there. You know, they have to know how we work. Because um, I, I actually just had this conversation with somebody yesterday, and the actually it was on Tuesday, but the conversation was I don't want a LeBron James on my team, mm-hmm. and the reason being because I want a Golden State pre Kevin Durant. Yeah, I, I want a team that that everybody knows their role. Everybody plays the team ball. Everybody's a superstar. We may have one or two sharp shooters. That's all we need. Mm-hmm. And those sharp shooters can lead the team. We can help out those in the back, help them fill their roles where everybody can be a superstar. We can win championships. So that's where we at. I have met with um, or had have some pretty heavy hitters wanting to come on board. But just based off the conversation, I knew they would absorb too much of our resources and I don't want that. I don't want one person to be an attention grabber, and then we lose focus on the other agents. Yeah, I see. I see that often. It's funny. I just had a conversation with a title rep recently mm-hmm. that um, she had met with a specific agent, and he's a pretty heavy hitter guy. Um, but when he met with her, he was like demanding all this attention, like. Just so you know, I'm high maintenance, and I need this, and I need that, and I need yep. that, and 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 it was like they were like, no, nah, then they were p- probably not a good fit because what you're saying, because the resources sometimes that the diva agents absorb yep. are absorb. not worth the volume that they bring in. Because listen, it's in a business that is low transaction. Because mm-hmm. you know, if you're ha- doing a hundred transactions, you're a super mega agent. But a hundred transactions is low volume in the schemes in the grand scheme of like a hundred transactions is what Walgreens does before 10 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like Absolutely. So in the scheme in the, in, in, in business, a hundred transactions per year is a low volume business. Yes. And when you're doing that, you just can't, you can't give, let any blood sucker come in and take all of your attention because then you have, 20 agents that do 10 to 15 deals that feel neglected and yep. it's just not good for the culture. It's not good for the culture. And what I, what I like to do is we, we really look at the families, not just the agents. Though. Mm-hmm. We really look at the families and we care about the well being of the families. We want the families to be, you know, a nice, happy, wholesome family. Mm-hmm. We want the wives or the husbands to support their spouse and what we're doing. And for the most part, we've done a really good job because most spouses and husbands are getting a license to join the team because they love what mm-hmm. we're doing. 
in the, in the direction we're going. So that's what that's what we're really pushing for. And so for us to take our attention away from the the growth of those families and helping them be more involved in their business and focus on one top producing agent or or one top producing team, what you do is you pull the resources from these mm-hmm. agents where you're sort of stunting their growth. Mm-hmm. And uh, like we, we sort of have uh, an example of um, what it looks like when you have a, a team that's like well-rounded, very team-oriented, because when you've helped people come up and you've helped them change their family lives, they're more so invested in your system. Sure. They're invested in the culture. And so when they bring somebody else up that looked just like them a year ago, they're willing to grab their hand and help us out to make sure they Because they know what that part. felt like. Yep. They remember that. Yep. Yeah, it's, that's one of the things that I that makes me cringe about a lot of the large franchise models mm-hmm. is that they'll take the money from producing agents to try to use that money for things, for shiny objects to try to recruit other agents. Yep. So I'm taking your money, and instead of taking you out to dinner with it, I'm taking your money so that I can go take someone else to dinner so that hopefully See. they join, and then I'll take their money and take someone else. It's just... It's a, it's almost uh, insulting to my intelligence when that's proposed because it's like, I I don't I don't have any interest in being part of a company that has a billion agents. Like the other billion agents don't help my business. Yep, and, you know? and that, that's a hundred percent right. Um, and that's like, I think I, w- I was on a TED show when I spoke about this. But when when I um, when I was Looking at building a, building a business, right? The main thing that I, w- I wanted to incorporate in our business model is what I felt that lacked. Mm-hmm. And so all the things that you see us do, like we have the yacht parties, and the yacht parties is just to reward the agents for doing a good job. You know, it's we have that celebration. We have our yearly celebration, our reward award celebration. Um, and even the first year, which was last year, we had our award celebration. We didn't have any sponsors. We could have had, but I just wanted to be intimate. I didn't want Notice it to be, that. you know, I didn't want, I didn't want it to be filled with all the commercialized stuff. I just want, I want them to know that I truly appreciated their commitment and the things that they was able to accomplish. Because if you look at our board, last year was only at like thirty agents, thirty five agents, mm-hmm. and all those agents who had less than a year of experience, mm-hmm. and they was able to accomplish that. And some of them hit six figures. I mean, life changing from, you know, they're making $30,000 a year to jumping out in real estate and doing six figures like their first year. Like that that's life changing for a family. Yeah. And I think it's funny because I noticed that when you did the words, I noticed there was no sponsors anywhere. And I'm like, I like that. Yeah. Because <laughs> it's funny. Every, everyone seems to be able to throw a hell of a party for their team or the agents or the brokerage. If they get the right right title company <laughs> and the right mortgage company and the right warranty company and the right inspection company on board, so it's a like, all right, Mister Broker, <laughs> you made six hundred thousand dollars last year. Mm-hmm. You couldn't throw this party without all these other people. And you know, what? and some people would say, well, that's leveraging resources. It is, but it when is. I was an agent in a company doing that, what I felt like it was a dog and pony show. That's what it felt like to me. It is, and the, the important thing was that. The title company was there. The mortgage company was there. So we had those people there, but it was more of a appreciation. appreciation. Yes. 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 Yeah. Th- it's funny because I, you know, I, I'm sort of the mu- same mindset, you know, like I, I have my partners that I work with, but I'm not like, hey, I'm throwing this party. Can you guys come pay for it? It's crazy. Like, it's funny because I have a lot of good friends of mine that are vendors that, you know, in the industry. Mm-hmm. And they'll confide on me some things <laughs> that, like, <laughs> they get three to four text messages every single day of, like, I'm throwing a customer appreciation party. Can you kick kick me 250 bucks to <laughs> I'm throwing, you know, I'm throwing this party. Can you throw me? I'm doing this broker shopping. Can you give me $300? Like, oh, geez. it's like this con- consistent money grab. And I'm yeah. like, oh, so bad. Uh, you know, I, I like our environment to be pure. All of our relationships are genuine. You know, I don't like the, the pay to play any game or, or pay to have friends or anything. I always like, if, if I'm going to be at the table, I want to bring some type of value to the seat that I sit in. You know what I call those agents that are always hitting people up for things? Those are welfare agents. 
<laughs> people don't know that that came from this podcast, that term. <laughs> the so will page. Those agents that, that sell like one house a year, but then they hit up the vendors and they're like, I'm throwing a customer appreciation party. Can you give me $500? Like, what? Yep. No, 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 no. Yep. And, and you know, um, and I, I guess I shouldn't say this, but I, I will. It's keeping it real estate, so. <laughs> so, um, so on a lot of my flyers that I put out, and I, I don't even think I promote that I do that anymore, but I have, like, sponsors on my flyers. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because we get these calls, like, every time we put out flyers. So we get these calls, how much are for the sponsored spots on your flyers? And my response is, they're not for sale. Mm -hmm. The sponsored ads you see on our flyers, they don't pay for those. We find businesses that needs help. And we put them on our flyers to give them exposure. Mm -hmm. They don't pay for that. We only looking to bring value to them, and so that throws them off completely. Yeah, that, that'll throw them <laughs> on a loop. That will totally throw them on a loop. It throws them off completely. But a lot of people don't really know, th like, the strategies behind a lot of things that we do because we don't, you know, like we're like not money sucking a company. We don't charge yeah. people for things, right? And um. And so it just throws them off when they see certain things. But I always preach, you know, into all the agents because a lot of them see the, a lot of the stuff that we do and they think that people are paying. But then I have to explain to them, no, it's the relationship. Yeah. Focus on the relationship. If you have to pay for that relationship, it won't last long. Right. Yeah, because there's always somebody going to be a higher bidder. Absolutely. There's going to be a shinier object. It's funny because we just did, um, I just did this sort of a magazine that I include every on every first meeting with a buyer or a seller and in there there's vendors and you know shout out to like urban young insurance mm -hmm. and jen mickles with movement mortgage and um and american home services home inspections like they're all in the magazine mm -hmm. and so when i when i was calling them to get the content to put it on the magazine they were like so how many copies are you printing how much <laughs> is this gonna be and i'm like nah it's, it's nothing like just send me a picture, send picture. me a logo, and I'll put it together. Like, oh, you need us to write something up or edit it? I'm like, no, I'm paying for that. Like, don't worry. Just send me a picture and a logo, and I'll take care of the rest. And, oh, man, and it was, like, mind-blowing to them because the call is generally asking them for money, and that's not, I, that's not the way that I am either. Wow. No, but, you know, like, I think you understand the concept. And I think that when you build a business model around that concept of adding value to other people, you're never going to go out of business. Right. Never. Yeah. I mean, I think everyone in real estate is vulnerable. And we talked about this a little bit before the <coughs> podcast that, I, yes. you know, I was telling you that my motto is like, I wake up unemployed every single day. My pendings are my severance package <laughs> because I lost my job, but. I'm unemployed and I have to try to earn a job every morning, whether it's a buyer or a seller. I have to try to earn a new job every single day when I wake up. Absolutely. And so, you know, that mindset is what makes me not want to burn bridges by charging people. Because here's the other thing. Does a lender really get any additional business for being put on my flyers? Maybe not. Yeah. You know, like maybe that's just as good as the conversation that I have with people and I'm not charging them for the conversation. So like, mm -hmm. why would I want to charge someone for something that brings no value? You know, like I'm, um, I, I, I'm very critical of the type of um, uh, sort of like the gurus that charge, you know, for their masterminds and they charge for, um, for this like motivational type classes and they charge people $199 or $299 for nothing. Like I'm very yes. critical of that. And, and I'm, a, I disagree, I'm a, I agree to disagree with people on this point, mm -hmm. but the bottom line is if I'm going to be critical of people that I feel charge for something of no value, I'm not going to go and charge vendors for something of no value. Like that's not going to happen. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I agree with you. We do the same with um, one of our preferred lenders as well. Um, but I think what we, I, I know that we add a lot of value. Mm -hmm. um, she's like, um, she's down in Miami for one. And um, in her in her company, she was like number two. Mm. And this was her, last year was her first year back. She was in mortgages like maybe, I don't know, back in 2010. Oh, man, all those Central Florida lenders are listening to this like, what? There is uh, no lenders in Central Florida? <laughs> <laughs> there is, there is. But you know what? And this is, 
this is how she became our preferred lender. So I was working with lenders. Well, you know, three years ago, I relocated my business here to Central Florida. Mm-hmm. When, and then I that's when I actually opened a brokerage as well. And I was looking for lenders because down in South Florida, you know, it's just a different type of hustle when it oh comes yeah. to lending, right? So I'm used to lenders. You know, when I took an appointment at 930 at night down in Miami, I'm used to a lender being there. Mm-hmm. They'll come out, you know, drive 45 minutes. They're there. And so when I come here, it was just a whole different, like, laid back, relaxed type mm-hmm. vibe. You know, you do things. Lenders say they'll come out. Oh, I'm not going to come. I'm just going to send you flyers. You know, you can pick these up. And so um, I had a couple of lenders stand me up. Um, I saw myself losing a lot of clientele. After I send my clients to the lenders to get pre-approved, you know, they wouldn't come back. Mm. It was just a lot of a lot of different scenarios. I'm like, man, what is really going on? I never had this this like type of experience before. And so um, we we just happened to. So I was open to working with different lenders. It's just something different because I, you know, my whole real estate career, I'd been used to only working with one or two lenders. So up here, I'm you know searching. I'm working with different lenders, just learning by experience. And we was to happen to do a home buyer workshop tour. Mm-hmm. The lender had confirmed with me that he was going to be, you know, there. And th- we he was from Orlando. He confirmed he would be in Miami. So two days before, he called me on the cruise ship. He's like, hey, I forgot I was going on this cruise. I'm like, geez, okay. We, we got iPhones, man. We got calendars in our iPhones. <sighs> like, how do you forget? And the part that really pissed me off is that we we created the marketing videos, of course. Of course. And we promoted his business. We promoted them, like, mm. for a whole month. So I'm like, okay, so you get all this promotion, all this free promo. We even did a, a, a recording, mm. right? We even sat down and did an interview with him and helped promote him and what he provides, even outside of what will be at the uh, workshop. And so two days before, he called me, hey, I forgot I, I, forgot I was going to be on this. Okay, well, cool. So I called her up. I said, hey, and she had been calling me, she'd been calling me. And I was like, you know, I'm, I'm good, I'm good on lenders, you know. And so this opportunity presented itself last minute. I called up, she said, when is it? It's like, uh, in two days, I know it's short notice. She said, I'll be there. Mm. And so she, and she was new, she was new back mm-hmm. in the real estate. And so she came, and I was sort of like nervous, of course, you know, you have a new lender coming to speak to 45 people, you know, and she brought the owner. She brought the owner. So she didn't speak. She brought the owner to speak. And so I got to know the owner. And and I, I really liked that gesture that she did because even though she knew that she wanted to be there, right? she knew that she wouldn't be able to add the value that I would be expecting. Mm-hmm. And so I respected that. And so it wasn't until maybe the third workshop that we did with her that she actually spoke herself. Mm-hmm. But every when we did our, our next tour, which was like two months later, we end up going to Orlando, Tampa, Orlando, Lakeland, Tampa, and Miami. She was like, I was like, well, we already have a lender for Lakeland and Tampa, but you can do the one in uh, Orlando and Miami. So we started in Miami, and she said, okay, cool. I'm going to come, and I'm just going to do the whole tour. Just in case somebody slip up, I want to be there. And that's what happened. In Tampa, somebody slipped up. Oh. She was there. And and Lakeland, um, the lady, she didn't slip up. She came late, but she was ready. She was ready to speak. So I said, after that, I was like, you know what? I respect her hustle. She get on the road. We didn't, yeah. you know, she 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 absorbed all That's the expenses. That's earning it. That's earning it. And ever since then, if we have an open house up here, she'll fly up. If we have a workshop here, and actually we have one this Saturday, she's flying up just for the day and heading right back. So it's, it's, she just earned her spot and. I think from her perspective, she respects what we bring, the value that we bring. Mm-hmm. So therefore, she knows that, you know, when we do our marketing, the videos, all that stuff costs money, mm-hmm. and she respects the value that it brings to mm-hmm. her. And so therefore, she pays for whatever she needs to pay to be there when we have these events. And um, and so when other people, when other uh, lenders, you know, reach out and want to be on a team or whatnot, it's just hard to feel the shoes. Right, you know, it's just hard to feel those shoes. Yeah, because that's someone that earned her spot, like repeatedly. It wasn't one gesture. It was, and that's the thing, right? Like these relationships. And you know, one thing that irks me too is like sometimes agents have a lender that has done really well by them for multiple years, Mm -hmm. and then they have a slip up or a file falls through, and they are like, "Oh my god, I I need a new lender," and I'm like. (laughs) 
dude, we're all humans. Like stuff's gonna happen. Like you can't. Like that's not the way to handle relationships. Exactly. And and that I think a lot of people realize who has done business with me. Mm -hmm. That like my heart and the intention in any relationship. And they know that, you know, I'm very, I'm caring about their family and their well-being. All, it can, because I know outside of business, we're all humans, right? So I know that, you know, they have a family that depends on them. So you can't just because somebody do slip up, right? You can't just throw them to the wolves. Because right. at the end of the day, all the way up until this point, their family trusted them and trusted you to help them. Mm -hmm. And so if they supported you in this journey, you know, by supporting you, they supported their spouse or whoever their family member was that was a part of your team. They supported them through this journey, so they supported you. So if you throw them to the wolves, you throw the people that supported them who supported you. Yeah. Yeah, it's not. But that's kind of part of this cancel culture thing that we have going on. And mm -hmm. it's not just in real estate. I mean, you see it. All over. You see it in social media. You see mm -hmm. it on families, like. You know, around Thanksgiving, people like, you know, not being able to go to their relatives because of politics or because of whatever. And it's like, you know, this whole cancel culture thing is like people, there's a, there is a non insignificant group of people who spend their day trying to figure out who they're going to cancel next. Yep. Like, what are you going to say wrong next so that I can cancel you? Mm -hmm. And so, like, I think sometimes people in real estate, they will fall prey of that bad habit. And then when a lender or a title company drops the ball, then they're like, forget it. I need a new one tomorrow, you know, and it, it doesn't necessarily help <coughs> that title companies and lenders are always looking for, l for agents. Mm -hmm. um, but it just shouldn't be that way. Like, I've slipped up with my clients. I mean... After Absolutely. so many years in this business and so many transactions, you will. listen, there is some that haven't been that I haven't been as good with as others. That's just mm -hmm. a real that's a reality of being a human. It is. Um, and I just hope people don't throw me away because of those either. <laughs> you know, right? Because that's what I hope. No, it, it's true. It's, it's 100 percent true. Right. And I think that not just people deserve a second chance. But again, people are human, period. Yeah. You know, and I think that if people love had personal feelings for the other person's well-being then you wouldn't be so disposable with you know with such short notice yeah well and a lot of times what happens is because our, our, all of our communication is through these devices email mm -hmm. text rarely phone calls but that's kind of like <laughs> the extent of how personal the communication gets mm -hmm. people are easier to throw other people away like you yep. wouldn't do that if you were face to face Yep. If it was like back in the old days where mm -hmm. like the preferred lender was sitting in the office, yep. you wouldn't throw them away like that on the, you know. No, and I, I think with the technology, like you say, that does help with, you know, that, that lack of connection between the different business partners, mm -hmm. you know, and, and uh, I, I'm, I'm a personable person, so I always like to meet face-to-face -face yeah. or, you know, have a web conference. We call that old school. <laughs> I am. So, <laughs> so th for instance, next week, right, We one of our agents was supposed to do this photo shoot for us, right, with another agent. And I'm like, well, I haven't been there since the beginning of January. Mm. I'm like, nah, I'm going to be there. Hey, you know, call him, let him know. You can set the appointment, but... I need I need to see him one of those days, you know. So I, I'm that type of person. I don't want I don't want you to go a whole two months without seeing me. You know, mm -hmm. I have to see you. I have to have a phone conversation. That's why I do. You know, make sure I call a certain amount of agents every single day because it's just you know you could text all day. Yes, we communicate all day through via text or social media. But you know, a lot of times, especially if it's, if it's my agents and they're texting me about a situation, yes, sometimes I can respond with them. You know, via text. Mm -hmm. But my reply, my reply is always call me. I don't care if it's just a two second conversation, a five five minute conversation. Call me. Yeah, because the there's so much that you get from a phone call that you don't get from a text. Yes. Context. Yes. Tonality. Yes. Because when you pick up the phone and someone is like, "Hey, hey, Emmett, uh, oh man, um, I had a question about this file, man. Um, you already know, like." Mm -hmm. there's something wrong there's something off yes uh, where you may not be able to get the urgency of whatever that issue is through a text message 
Absolutely. And and two, I want people to get into a habit of calling when you need help. Calling when you have a question. I don't want you to text because a text can be very vague and then sometimes I some miss this, miss this information. Yeah, exactly. And then some conversations or topics need to be elaborated. Sure. Most most things in real estate. You know, yes. it always cracks me up when I see on the real on the Facebook groups like uh my inspection deadline was yesterday and you know like no 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 like we really need to dissect this what type of contract was there when was it executed like like mm-hmm. there's so much to every single question that it's it's very difficult that there will be a real estate question that you can answer on a text back a like text. that um, most yep. of the time you're going to have three or four or five questions to really get a full understanding of what's happening because mm-hmm. it's in a real estate tran- transaction, nothing lives in a vacuum. Yeah, every part of it is linked to the next part, and to the next part, and to the next part. So you can't just isolate it and be like, okay, how do we address with this thing? Well, if everything else matters, right? Absolutely, every every single part matters. You're right. And uh, so you're talking to your agents constantly. I mm-hmm. see that you do a ton of marketing uh, with your agents. <coughs> yes, yes, we do. Um, you know, uh, our whole theme is that. When no matter the experience of the agents, no matter the background, where they come from, we only care about where they want to go. And with that being in mind, we just want to make sure they have the best opportunity to go out here and exceed. Mm -hmm. You know, if you start, if you're starting out as an agent, we don't want you to look like a green agent. Mm -hmm. You know, we want you to look like you've been in business five years, 10 years, um, because for one, we have your back on everything. Um, and that's why I want to get the agents, you know, accustomed to calling me. So I, 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 you know, of course we have, um, new agents on the team. So I was doing my calls this week and a couple of calls, you know, the guys were pretty excited that I called them cause they wasn't, you know, they came from another brokerage, mm-hmm. but they wasn't used to that. Mm-hmm. So they're like, Oh man, you, you call me. I was like, absolutely. You would you think I wouldn't call? It was like, I'm, you know, I just wouldn't, you know, I not, I'm not used to it. And so, um, it was a it was a good feeling, you know, to know that you know, you're just by you calling them and checking on them, you you know, you give them that 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 I don't know that energy, that spark, that confidence that they yeah. need, you know, because you know. Well, I, it gives two things. It it provides accountability mm-hmm. and energy, and the the part of the accountability is huge because now they know that you're looking at them. Mm-hmm. Now yes. they know that. You know, one of the problems with giant brokerages, and this doesn't get talked about very often, is a giant brokerage is like a field with seven feet tall grass where it's really (laughs) easy to hide. So you have all these agents hiding under that tall grass and no one's calling them out and they're not really motivated. And, you know, I (laughs) it's funny because I kind of equate it always to that thing. Like if you do something multiple times and you fail at it, Mm -hmm. you will be discouraged. Absolutely. You know, and that's across like the animal kingdom. You know, there's plenty of experimental motivation about this that Mm -hmm. that, you know, if if uh, if any being does something to try to gain a reward and it doesn't work after Mm -hmm. a while, they just give up. Yeah. And so what you're doing is you're telling these agents, hey, I see you. I'm looking at you. I'm making sure that you're good, but I'm also making sure that you're going to be good. Absolutely. And so th- that's, I, I don't think people, brokers think of it in those terms oftentimes. They think like it's babysitting. Well, no, that's kind of offensive. You're not babysitting grown adults. What you're doing is letting them know that you're paying attention to what they're doing, that they're not going to get lost on the tall weeds here. Yep. You know, um, and th- that's important. That's important because early on when I first started the brokerage, I wasn't doing that. And what I did find was that the people who did not have, you know, the deals on the table or if they did have a deal on the table and it went bad, they got discouraged. You know, so um, just over the years of just learning, learning by experience. And I just I realized just the power of that phone call, what it does to people. Um, it, it's a lot of times because we have these morning calls um, every Monday and sometimes people are not able to make the call so they don't get all the news mm-hmm. or they don't get the updates they don't get the motivation they don't get that time to to speak their piece or whatever they're going through so when i do the follow-up call and i ask them hey did you get that last video did you see that you know you know we have this coming up on um, what do you have planned for you know d- are you doing this so mm-hmm. i'm just sort of reminding them of some of the things that they should do because we also have to keep in mind that 
real estate is a business and you have a lot of people who get into the business with no business experience. Yeah. So learning real estate is one journey, but then learning to be a business owner is another journey. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, you have to help them build both and remind yeah, I've been able to deal with that. Um, the perceived freedom that <laughs> the agents have. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the things that I like that you said is that you treat new agents like you don't treat them like they should be green. You treat them, you expect them to conduct themselves like professionals on day one. Absolutely. And that's important. I think it's extra important when someone is green because it builds a habit. Because mm -hmm. I think the bad thing is when agents are green and they're treated like they're green and they just, the habits get built around this green agent and yep. they never develop into the real professionals that they are capable of being because they were provided with the disservice of um, too much hand holding, not enough training and not enough accountability. Absolutely. Absolutely. And one of the other things that the reason why I make those phone calls too is because I want to see what they're learning. I want to see how they took the message for the day and how they analyzed it. Um, I want agents to get used to reaching out, not just to myself, but to anybody, because if I feel like if I reach out to them, and most of them think that I'm too busy to take those phone calls. Mm -hmm. I'm too busy to talk to them. But if I reach out to them and I'm trying to give them recommendations on whatever situation they be they may be having, you know, um, what one one phone call we we had an agent who they had their first listing appointment. They really didn't know what to do or how to prepare for it. You know, we we have this six week training that we do with all the new agents. So in I think it's like week four we get into the listings. And so we hadn't got that far yet. Mm -hmm. And so they was reaching out to other agents, trying to pull some things together. So I just happened to, you know, catch them before this appointment and would just say, we're to give them some pointers, mm -hmm. you know, show them where to get the, the listing template from and then show them the verbiage, what to, what to use. Mm -hmm. And they got the listing. Yeah. They, you know, they got the listing and just, it was more so I wanted them to divert all the attention to the team. Don't go in the, and my whole thing was don't try to sell yourself. Because they know you're new, no matter how much you try to explain or how professional you try to be, sell the team that's behind you. Right. Yeah. And that's what he did. Yeah, he which it. is important. It's funny because I just, I just taught a class in my brokerage that I came up with. And um, when I was trying to figure out what to call this class, which encompasses anything from, from you know, setting up your business and, and being able to track your business to buyers and sellers and then marketing and post transaction stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's like a four part class that I came up with. And the name that I came up with, it was face it until you make it instead of fake it until you make <laughs> it. Cause that advice of fake it until you make it was always like nails on a chalkboard to me. Mm. I'm like, this is not that complicated, man. Yeah. It's not like you don't have to fake it. No. Like if you happen to be put in that predicament that you're brand new and you are blessed with listing appointments, Find someone to help you. That's it. You don't have to lie to people. That's you it. You don't have to go in there and lie and fake it. You can go in there and be honest and be like, hey, although I'm new in the business, I have the backing of the top real estate agent. I have the backing of people with 10 years. I have the backing of, you know, 200 transactions. I have the back, you know, like yep. you, you can instill confidence on a consumer if you're honest and, um, and you show truly what your assets are. Absolutely. Um, sometimes I think what we do really good as agents is telling other people what we know, but <laughs> what we don't do very well is understanding what we don't know. Absolutely. And the understanding part is key, mm -hmm. man. It's key. And m most, most, I think most sellers, they're not looking for you to come in and be blown out of the park because they've already talked to other people that may have blown it out of the park already. Mm -hmm. And they're looking for that honesty and transparency. You know, they know when you sit at the table, what you've done nine times out of 10, they've already looked you up. Mm -hmm. They know you, you know what your experience may be. And you only sit at the table because they like something about you. Mm -hmm. And so it's just up to you to seal the deal. Not screw it up. Basically. Yeah. And not screw it up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. By the time you sit with them, your job is to not screw it up. Yep. Yeah. One of the things I, I I'm, I'm a big proponent of is transparency. Mm -hmm. I think if, if, our if agents generally speaking if our whole industry became a little more transparent because for the longest time it was like smoke and mirrors yeah like if you talk to a realtor from 40 years ago the process was oh. like 
they had this book of listings <laughs> that they kept with a tight grip. Oh and you will tell them what you were looking for, and they will comb through the book and be like, ah, there's two houses. Well, maybe <laughs> there were six, but there's two that was their company's listings. Mm -hmm. So they would take you to the... So there was kind of like this smoke and mirror um, sort of like slay of hand feel to the industry. And I think one of yeah. the things that, that, that would be good for our industry going forward is finding more areas of transparency, finding more areas that we can provide clarity to the consumer. Because a lot of people are like, well, all the information is out there, but that's not good enough. Every day you have to figure out a way to be more transparent and more clear. Absolutely. And, and um, uh, what, what we've had issues with in the past, and I know this, this topic always you know ruffle a lot of feathers, is the agents that have been in the business for a while. Oh, yeah. And when you, when you get Co on the phone. Cooked in bad habits. <laughs> when you get on the phone and the first thing they say is, I've been in this business for 20 years. Oh. The first thing that comes to my mind is, oh, geez, it's going to be a raw, bumpy ride. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Um, I always say, like, whenever they give you that, I've been doing this for 20 years. I actually said to someone, I'm not proud of this, but I actually said to this <laughs> one lady who was killing a transaction for no reason. Mm -hmm. Like she, she took it upon herself to kill this deal. That's what it seemed like to me. She's like, you listen to me. I've been doing this for 15 years. And I'm like, it sounds like you've been doing it wrong for at least 15 years. Oh, Let's hope man. we can fix it going forward. It didn't go well from there. <laughs> um, the b her broker had to get involved and we ended up closing the deal. But but there's that mindset, I think, oftentimes of like cemented seniority. Mm. Like this is not the military. Yeah. You don't get a rank. No, you don't. You know, like the, in the you military, don't. you become a general and you're forever a general. It mm -hmm. doesn't matter who, you know, you're a lieutenant colonel. You may run faster than me or be more <laughs> capable or smarter, but I still got that rank. I still got the rank. Um, but in the real estate, doesn't work that way because we're unemployed every day. We talked about it, right? Every day. Every, every day we're day. unemployed. So I don't care if you sold a thousand homes last year. That doesn't, that's not an indicator of what you're going to sell next year. No, it's not. It's an indicator that you better be making a lot of phone calls to get some referrals from last year. But yeah, yeah it's not, it's not a guarantee. Yeah, it's not a guarantee. And not only is it not a guarantee, um, if you, if you're someone that's used to a lot of transactions and you're mm -hmm. set up wrong, that's a, another problem. Because yep. oftentimes we look at a transaction volume as an indicator for wisdom. And then you dive into some <laughs> of these operations and you're like, yep. you are not profitable. Yep. You are paying too much money out there. You, you know, the whole thing of people wanting to back away from the business mm -hmm. and then they have six, seven salaried employees and, you know. Yep. I, I think this business is, you have to be involved in the business. You know, you can't have a, a business model that's a passive income and be a successful real estate broker or a successful real estate team. You just have to stay involved in the operation just to make sure that, you know, all the ducks are lined up, all the T's are being crossed, the I's are being dotted, and people are being efficient. And at the same time, you're not losing that personable touch to the business yeah and being able to correct course because mm -hmm. that's a problem too the problem is when a broker disappears from a business mm -hmm. by the time that broker figures out that there's something wrong that ship has already veered yep. far away from its original yep. route if you're pressed and on it every day you're able to catch it right away the Absolutely. moment that ship starts pointing the wrong direction you go hey we got to figure this out Yep. And s s I think that's a great benefit with boutique brokerages with small companies. I mm -hmm. think that's a huge benefit. And of course, it doesn't get spoken about a lot because, you know, it's not it's not a good selling point if you're a giant company to talk about this. But, <laughs> you know, the boutique companies for their customers and their agents, they offer an advantage of being able to pivot quickly, yep. whether it's a market change whether yep. it's a new system, yep. you know, being some of these large companies are locked up with technology companies that provide them systems for the next five years. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe next year there's a better system, and but they're true. locked in. They're yep. locked in with this other company. 
That's true. And so, but you're as, as, a, as a boutique brokerage, you don't have you, you don't have to encumber yourself with that. Mm -mm. There's something kick-ass tomorrow that's going to help you sell homes for your sellers faster. You can jump on it We're right away. On it. <laughs> you don't need a council <laughs> meeting. You don't need a board meeting. You don't need to ask nope. the stockholders. You just do it. Yep. And look, we had our first board meeting like this past week, and so everybody was like, "This is weird." <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But it was good. It was good. Yeah. You know, um, and I guess before, I, because it was just me, um, you know, it was being able to go over, go over like different strategies that you that you have going on and being able to bounce ideas off of people, you know, and being that I guess I'm so hands on and involved, mm -hmm. people are free to be themselves. So, you know, you get people giving their advice. You know, and because I like I like for people to fly, I like for people to come That's on important. board and you know it's and important. be their best. You know, give me all the advice you have. You know, I absorb it all. You know, if I do not agree with something, you know, we'll discuss. Sure. Yeah, you know, I don't agree with that. You know, and, and this is why. And I think that this could be a learning moment for you. But if you can prove me wrong, then it's a learning moment for me. Yeah, it's conversation, man. There's nothing wrong with conversation. It it, it keeps being. Um, I think our society likes to make it this taboo thing, like yeah. discussing ideas that are in opposing ends of, um, of a specific topic and shouldn't be that way. Like no. conversation is how we figure stuff out. Conversation is how we get better. Conversation is how we move forward. Yeah, absolutely. You know, if you're going to have a group of people around you that are afraid to tell you an opposing view, yeah. you are a terrible leader. And if you're yep. not able to handle someone telling you an opposing view on something, whatever that may be, you're a terrible leader. There was a podcast, actually, um, that I shared last week that was Joe Rogan with Daryl Davis. That's this gentleman's name. He's a black musician. He plays uh, jazz, jazz in the Northeast. He has a band. He's been a musician his whole life. Mm -hmm. He's converted over 200 and something KKK members and white nationalists to wow. change their ways and to look at a different, you know, to look at life through a different lens. And they've abandoned the KKK and abandoned all these hate groups simply because this dude was able to have a conversation with them. Wow. Understanding. You know, he, would yep. came, he came, he would come from, and, and that's an extreme, you know what I'm it saying? Is. Like, that's an extreme situation, you know? Absolutely. And people look at that and say, oh, my God, he's crazy. That's actually the most basic thing in the planet is having a conversation. And this all stemmed from like him playing music and someone being like, oh man, I like your music. And he's like, can I have you, you want to sit down and have a conversation? The guy being like, I never had a drink with a black guy before. And he was laughing, <laughs> starts laughing. He's like, and then he's like, the guy pulls out his KKK, like whatever little, you know, yeah. I don't know if they have a, like a ID or whatever. <laughs> I don't know what they carry, but like he pulls it out and he looked at it and he was like, oh, this is for real. And then since then, since then, he's kind of made it his mission to talk with his people. Yeah. Just have conversations with people and conversation. If conversation can get someone to turn away from the KKK, you know, I think we can accomplish a whole lot more than we're accomplishing right now. I 100% agree. I think that a lot of the hate stem from the lack of the communication. Sure. People may not understand um, a lot of things when it comes to either different cultures, different ethnic backgrounds, whatnot. And so you may have one bad apple that may fit that profile, mm -hmm. you know. But in all actuality, no matter what scope you're looking from, they would fit the same profile. Yeah. So, we, but the problem is that everybody get put in that same basket mm -hmm. when it may not be the case. And so, of, of course, the conversation, the understanding – where people come from, understanding people' thought process and why they may have that thought process. It could be something in the in the past and the history, something to experience that you know sort of blocked off of a point of view for them. Sure. And you know, just understanding that. And a lot of times, it's it's because a lot of people are going through a lot of emotional distress in life, you know, and 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 it carries over into the other aspects of their of their world and their life. And yeah, that's that thing, right? Like. If I have a cast on my leg, no one expects me to run a marathon. But there is <laughs> people with depression, and we're expecting them to function in society yep. normally, you know, yep. because we don't see it. Absolutely. You know, and that's oftentimes the problem with mental things, right? Like people are going through whatever distress or loss of job or whatever is going on or a breakup or whatever is going on in their life, 
and we expect them to function in society like if nothing was wrong, you know, yep. because there's not a physical um, thing that we can look at and point at and be like, oh, that's what's wrong. It's the broken leg, you know. And, you know, it's speaking about, like, the whole mental um, disorder. That's another reason why I make those phone calls because people don't really understand the whole mental aspect that when you're transitioning from a corporate nine to five mm -hmm. into real estate as an entrepreneur, there's a lot of pressure put up on you. For sure. And be out from the outside looking in, like uh, from the inside looking out, for one, it creates depression because you don't want to go out here and look unprofessional or talk to people about things you're not equipped to, you don't really know just mm -hmm. yet. But at the same time, you you want to make money. You mm -hmm. have to make money in the business. So it, it it for one isolates people, and that creates depression, the lack of confidence in themselves. Everything about real estate when you transition into this entrepreneurship, it creates some type of mental disorder, and people have to fight that and get over that if they want to have a mental health. Y you know, like it, it's it's very it's very health conscious. Yeah, and what happens I think a lot of times with those agents, to your point, is misery loves company mm -hmm. and what happens is those people end up finding people in the same spot and then you have this whole group of people who are not producing who are depressed yep. and then instead you know because they're all in this bad spot mm -hmm. that that's not a situation that from my experience um tends to uplift the group yep. it just ends up sinking them all down because and you have like this circle of constant negativity. And so when, when the broker takes ownership and is making those calls, you're throwing a line to them every time. Yeah, every time they're time. sliding into one of those buckets of people that are miser that you know, they're miserable yep. and they need company in their miserable bucket, you're throwing a lifeline and you're saying, Hey, come yeah. here, let's talk. And you know those conversations allow me to have the conversation to where I make them appraise their friends. Mm hmm so I always make them list, you know, three people they talk to the most. And I make them appraise them. And, uh, and that's their first lesson of learning and understanding real estate, of value. If you're, if you're listing your home and all the comps that you have for the home are bad, what do you think that value for the home is going to yeah. be? That's, that's a great analogy. And so that's the first thing that real estate agents need to understand, that the company they keep will either make them or break them when it comes to their value and what they have to bring. Yeah, I. that's a great analogy, man. That's that Someone should put that on a board somewhere and <laughs> stick it in some office somewhere because it's true. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and to the same point, what happens is if you're a new agent and you don't have a lot of business and you have a lot of free time during the day when the kids in are in school, the three people that are you're going to talk to the most are three people who have nothing going on during the day, who yep. their kids are, are at school, you know, which is more often than not people in the same boat that you are. Same and boat. And it takes you into deeper depression. Yeah. And, and it's funny because this, that's part of why I do this. And awesome. part of the reason why I like to do these conversations is because it's become foreign in our industry for mm -hmm. agents, specifically agents from different companies, mm -hmm. to sit down and talk about life, talk about business, talk about everything, just an open, genuine conversation because it's taboo, like it's almost like there's like if there was trade secrets, you're like, oh, you don't want to talk to an agent from that company. Like, <laughs> but but it doesn't have to be that way. Like this Absolutely is you know not. this is healthy. And someone listening to this that's new to the industry that's feeling like, maim, I'm a little depressed. Like things are not going well. Like you should be depressed because you're right. You don't have shit going on <laughs> right now. However. Just because you don't have shit going on right now, it doesn't mean that the solution is going to be for you to like close yourself out. Yep. It's more important for you to go out and seek friends who you can appraise and people of value in your life that you can appraise and that can yep. bring up your the value of yourself. Yourself, absolutely. You know that's that's extremely important. And and like and I have to have those conversations with new agents if they if I feel like they're ever going to be really successful mm -hmm. because it, it doesn't matter how much training, how much work you put into people. If they're going to stay in the same company or comps, then their value is never going to increase. Yeah. We, s we see it in athletics, right? Absolutely. We athletics. see it football players, basketball players, you know, 
they they stay with their little circle of friends that they ran with when they were young and, and you know it takes then Aaron right Hernandez back. yeah it takes them right back to where they came from yeah and let's not overlook that this comps it does not exclude family members either of course no no, no. <laughs> yeah no it, for it, sure because a lot of times the family members could be the worst comp out of the comps that you choose to help appreciate your value yeah. so we we have to always keep in mind and and we have a couple of different things that we use to appraise the comps, but um, in one of them is family, relationships, and also finances, mm -hmm. right? And those are the main three things pretty much that you're being judged by by the world anyways, right? Yeah. You have bad finances nine times out of ten, you have bad credit. Mm -hmm. And so no matter where you go, I don't even know about the family. Mm -hmm. Your credit score is bad, okay, well, I know how they're going to judge you. Yeah, it's it's not a... It's not an easy thing for a lot of people to do because they, we want to look at um, a life through some like some rosier color lenses. Mm -hmm. But um, truth be told, I mean, and I've listen. I'm an immigrant. I I've had to put my life on a suitcase and and you know, mm -hmm. be in a different place. So I think I think people should uh, become more acquainted with that. And I I think it's good that you're in the leadership position and you're having those conversations with people, saying like, hey man, like. I know you're trying to do the best here, but listen, you know, if your brother keeps calling you three times a day to give him a ride somewhere, maybe that's not going to be conducive of you being a successful real estate agent. Absolutely. You know, you can't if if I'm having you issues. You just put logic to word. That's all you're doing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and, and it's important. And of course, I'm looking for feedback off those conversations. So when I speak with them and we have a conversation, you know, how's the family? And, you know, and they and when they start getting the response back or whatnot, or hey, how the, how did they go yesterday? Or, you know, and, and it's just, you can sort of tell, you know, when there were some negative seeds planted mm -hmm. because the conversation is not as light as it should be. Mm -hmm. And so um, w when I have that, when I get that vibe and that energy, then my next step is, hey, when, you, when the next time you're going to be in the office? Because now I want to I wanna dig a little bit deeper and I want to make sure they get some company or some good energy mm -hmm. so they can know how the conversation is supposed to flow. Mm -hmm. When you come up with an idea, you're supposed to have supporting, you know, feedback, not negative feedback. Oh, you know, don't don't make those calls or, you know, oh, you shouldn't go over there. Nobody wants you coming to the door or, you know, those yeah. flies not going to do anything for you. You know, so it's just you got to have some positive reinforcements. Yeah, it's it's a it's a really tricky thing for new agents. It really is. I've. I've always been blessed to have a strong support group around me that kind of like rallies behind every stupid idea that I have. <laughs> so what it turns out to be is like I end up making a lot of stupid mistakes and then but the all the other ones seem to pay off more, you know, the good ideas seem to pay off more <laughs> and so the net result is still positive for me, you know, but uh, but it's important to have that support group because like you said, you know, the last thing a new agent who's scared to go out and do door hangers yep. needs to hear is their significant other or their mom or yep. their brother or their cousin or their neighbor go to them like, what? You're going to go put um, door hangers on a Saturday afternoon? Man, you're crazy, dude. Like, nah, don't do that. Yep. Just come watch the football game with us. You don't have to do that. That's stupid. Yep. No one's going to call you from that. Nobody's like, going to call you. The dog's going to get you. Hey, you're going to get shot. You yeah. know, everybody have ring doorbells that can see you. They're not going to open up. Yeah. You get all of that. All the objections. Yep. Uh, all, all day. The objections that people like to say so that they don't do it. <laughs> Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. Emmett, thank you so much for coming. We just did over an hour here. Oh, Time crap. flies. It's like a time capsule in here. It's like a time machine. It does. Time does fly. But thank you. Thank you for having we'll me. We'll definitely do this again. I, I love talking to you, and I love what you're doing. I'll, um, if people want to find out what you're doing and your next seminar and everything else that you are involved with, how can they reach you best? They can reach me on my on Instagram page, and that's Emmett, E-M-M-I-T-T, Combs, C-O-M-B-S, or they can um, check us out on our website, conespremier.com. Um, click on the events tab. We normally have all the upcoming events on that events tab. Emmett, thank you so much, buddy. Thank you. <laughs>